Well, good morning, Christ Community Church. Welcome to those of you who are gathered at one of our campuses, uh, or perhaps you're watching this online with your family right now, gathered in your, in your living room. Uh, we're just glad to, to have you with us, and you're about to hear a, an incredible story. And Tammy Jo, I'm going to jump right in. I'm, you know, I just, I'm curious, how does a girl want to you know, grow up being a fighter pilot. Tell us about your, your family. What were your mom and dad like? Um, well, I think, you know, growing up, we always think our parents are very ordinary. Uh, but uh, they were extraordinary. Um, one of the things that I, I see now, looking back, is just how they, they took the time to teach, teach us the joy in hard work and, and the thrill of problem solving. I mean, when they gave us responsibility, they gave us authority with it so that it was all ours to figure out. And um, so I think that and just um, arming us with this idea of, of um, if you have the ability to do it, then do it. Go do it. Go yeah. do it. Yeah. So g give us some context when you talk about hard work and whatever. You didn't right. grow up in like a suburban uh, at the end of the cul-de-sac sort of thing. Uh, where, right. where did you... Where'd you grow up? Uh, nowhere, New Mexico. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it called Tularosa. Yeah. Uh, no, wonderful little, uh, it was actually a Spanish village. It wasn't even a township. But uh, we lived a few miles outside of that, uh, far enough that there weren't telephone poles, so no telephone and no television. And so uh, we, we had a working ranch, uh, pigs, uh, cattle, alfalfa, milo, wow. and work needs a workforce, so wow. uh, everybody pitched in. You had to, you had to, do, to do your fair share. Yes. So one day, uh, you're, you're near an Air Force base, one day planes are going overhead, and you're thinking, that would be something I'd like to do one day. So you announced to your mom and dad, I want to be a pilot. Uh, what was their reaction? Right. Um, my dad went on doing whatever he was doing. I think he nodded his head, but that was it from dad. And mom said, she took a minute to look at what was going on, and then she looked at me and said, those people are smart. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just she didn't have any clue. She'd never yeah. flown, and she yeah. was yeah. beyond her, so she was kind of thinking, I don't, I don't have any guidance for you there. Yeah, you're not. And uh, so I mulled that over for, for a while, and I thought, you know, I make an A now and then. I, I mean, I think I could try. And uh, so I mentioned it again, and she said, you've had cavities. <laughs> and, and I thought, and, and what where does is, that have to do? With right. <laughs> and she said, and I asked that time, I, I went a little deeper, and she said, you've had your cavities filled at ground level. When you go to altitude, your teeth will explode. <laughs> and and uh, I thought, I can't believe all the people in this world that don't have cavities. I right. mean, there's people that right. fly all the time. Yeah. Um, so I looked a little deeper. My dad said, you know, just find a pilot. And, yeah. and ask them. Okay, okay. So I, I want to get to the spiritual part of your story early on because it, your relationship with God has hugely influenced your life. Oh, yes. So it began as a summer camp experience. I mean, tell us right. how you came to the point of surrendering your life to Christ, deciding I'm going to follow Jesus. Right. I, we'd always gone to church. My mom was a Christian. Uh, my dad was not. And so we'd always gone to church, and I, I really came away from it with the idea that God was kind of an um, angry, bearded old man in the sky waiting for me to mess up. And when we went to uh, the first church camp, it was the summer before high school, and there, they were going through the book of James, and when they, they went through and I read James 1, 5, where he says, if you lack wisdom, ask me. I will give it to you generously, and I won't resent you asking. And I, it just shattered my image that I had of God. And I thought, this is a God who is persuasively speaking to me, and he's not saying, you will behave. He's not worried about my behavior. He just wants me to believe, and he only wants me to believe one simple truth. And that is that he loves me. Yeah. And so looking at scripture through that lens, it changed. It went from a book of rules 
to a love letter and um, never turn back. Wow. So, so speaking of the love letter, God's, yeah. God's love letter, and, and, and I love the way you put that. There, there's something about uh, surrendering your life to Christ that opens the Bible up as a brand new book, doesn't yes. it? I mean, yes. you, you know, I see that all the time. I'm in Bible studies with guys, and, and uh, for those who are cracking the binding on a Bible for the first time, mm -hmm. as a follower of Jesus, it's like, wow, I never knew that this book could speak to me like it does. Right. So you started this habit of regular Bible reading and of journaling. <laughs> I, I read a lot about, you know, and by the way, this is a great autobiography. It's got so much good stuff in it. But I read over and over again about the role that the Bible and journaling play in your life. So right. just talk about both of those for, for a minute. What are the benefits of reading the Bible right. and of, you know, putting some ink to paper, so to speak? Right. I had, I had started journaling with my dad in the ranch journal that kept track of piglets and, and hay fields and milo uh, per acre. Uh, but and then I graduated a little bit. When I became a Christian that summer, when I got to know Christ, uh, it, journaling was already a small part of my life. And at that um, camp, they said, you can, you can turn, you form your own Bible study. And here are the three questions you should approach every scripture with. What is God saying? What's he saying to me? And what am I going to do about it? And just put those questions at the header, you know, of these pages and then fill that out. And you've created your own uh, dive in to the Bible. And so that coupled with already journaling a little bit, journaling a little bit that just became a, a lifelong process of pouring out my heart before the Lord wow. and, and him help, letting him sort through it with me and... And then I could leave it there at his feet. It was easier for me to leave it once I poured it out on paper yes. and, and move on. Wow. Th this is a great truth I hope you grab hold of. So you don't need to be a, a dear diary type of person. <laughs> uh, but there is something, wh whether you write it down in a journal or you just do it audibly in prayer, uh, you discover a relationship with God makes progress as you see that you could process life. You could talk with God about the stuff going on in your life. And as I, I read your book and this journaling thing kept coming up, I'm realizing, well, that's exactly what Tammy Jo was, was doing on a regular basis, right. uh, processing the stuff that she was going, going through in her life with, with God. Wonderful. So you were a very active high school student. Uh, you played flute in the band and you were president of the student council and a cheerleader and what so your class takes a trip to Washington DC and you gotta fly and you're in an airplane. It's like, whoa, this is so cool. You come back and your school has a career day. So you go to an aviation class where a, an Air Force pilot is speaking. Right. And what happened to your dream at that point? Well, the first thing he asked me was, are you lost? <laughs> it was previews of coming attractions, really. But uh, I said, no, sir, I signed up for aviation. And he shook his head. He goes, this is career day, not hobby day. Go find, oh. You need to go find something girls can do. Like, like a cooking class or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, I was already inside the classroom. I just took the closest empty seat. Uh, it wasn't out of courage or defiance. It wasn't our school. We'd bust into the big sophisticated town of Almogordo, New Mexico. The buses were locked. I had nowhere to go. And I did get to listen to a real pilot. So that was, you know, at least part of my goal was, was met. <laughs> wow. Well, so the... Air Force pilot initially is giving off vibes that this is not a, 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 a women's career path. I would and say so more than vibes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was pretty direct. <laughs> so you go to the counselor, the guidance counselor. Right. It, did, did you get any more uh, encouragement there? She agreed with him. Move <laughs> on. <laughs> go look for something else. Right. Okay. Your mom, as I recall, she gave you some really good advice at this point with regard to those who were kind, right. of, kind of raining on your parade. Well, and she had, my original goal was to be a, a racehorse jockey. <laughs> and uh, at five, seven in seventh grade and growing, she said, Tammy Jo, you might give the jockey a leg up on one of those horses, but you'll never <laughs> ride them. So choose something that you're suited for. And she pointed out Ephesians 2.10. You know, we are God's poema. We are his creation, his workmanship. Yeah. And he has created us on purpose 
for a purpose, yeah. and you will be suited to what you're supposed to do. And it's not just one thing. It's not like you, you, if you choose this, you'll make it. That'll be God's will. If you choose something else, oh, my goodness, you've missed it. Yeah. Not at all. He's created us to do a number of things. But find what you're suited for and pursue that. Yes. Wow. Again, another great piece of advice. And if you're unfamiliar with that verse, Ephesians 2.10, uh, it comes after Ephesians 2.8 and 9. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take a lot of brilliance to figure out, right? But verses 8 and 9, <laughs> they say we're saved by grace through faith in Christ. So we become brand new people in Christ. And then the next verse goes on to say, and so you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. So when you begin a relationship with Jesus, God's got a plan for your life. You're his workmanship. He's got something really special in store for you. Now, Tammy Joe, I found it surprising that with all this bent toward aviation, you, you went to college and you decided you didn't major in aviation. No. But you you went to a friend's brother's graduation from Air Force <laughs> And you saw something in the graduating class there that caught your right. eye and turned you around. What was it? I met another pilot among all those. She was getting her wings. She. She. And so I went up and talked to her because I thought she must be like one of those really big brains, like a rocket scientist. Yeah. And uh, so I went up to talk to her, and she was a biology major. Yeah. I was a biology major. You know, I thought, okay, there is a way under this fence. Wow, and wow. I tried again. So you made your appeal, like, let's go military, right? Air Force, Army, Navy, what kind of response did you get? Well, the Air Force told me, no, uh, we don't need women. <laughs> and I waited till somebody else was behind the desk. I thought, let me try his counterpart. And he said, no, we, we, you can't take the test. You cannot have a piece of paper to fill out. And so I went back and got the, the newspaper clipping, which they, the Air Force was advertising for pilots. If you have your four-year degree and you want to fly, we want you. And you know they had the big picture of Uncle Sam, like, yeah, come, come we on. need pilots. Yes. So I cut it out. I took it in, and they went, do you have a brother that wants to fly? Don't <laughs> come back. No girls. <laughs> and uh, so I went on to the Army. They were polite, listened to my whole spiel, and they said, you're not a fit for us. And so I went to the Navy, and they said, sure, take a test. And, uh, but after I took the test, it would take me two more years and three recruiters to find somebody that would let me fill out an application. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you finally made it in, and you made it in through the Navy yes. after the Air Force and the Army and whatever turned you down. You go to aviation officer training school. Right. Your class, 75 people in your class, how many of them women? Right. It was known as the class of girls okay. because there were three of us never <laughs> happened before three out of 75 yes. and and you really couldn't tell because the very one of the first things they do maybe day two or three is you get a haircut and we had a buzz cut just like the guys it just and my own mom said don't send any more pictures home until your hair grows out <laughs> you're scaring your little brother and sister <laughs> yes. yeah Shaved heads can be, can be frightening. Yours yeah. look very good. <laughs> you had your first near-death experience while you're doing this officer training yes. stuff. Yeah. Tell us how you almost drowned while in flight training. Right, <laughs> right. Seems wrong. Um, well, we finished academics, and so this was now pressures off. We're just doing um, survival training. So there was one of the first things that we did was a Dilbert Dunker. And it's a, like a jet uh, cockpit that you strap into, and then it goes down the rails and flips upside down in the swimming pool. And then you unbuckle and get out. You know, it's so you're underwater while you're underwater, trying to Underwater, completely okay. underwater. And okay. it's so that if that should happen to you and jets tend to flip upside down, uh, that you don't get disoriented and you can make it out. And everybody was going fine, and they didn't trust us to snap ourselves in, so they snapped us in. Well, when I went down, flipped over, undid all but one, it wouldn't uh, undo. Uh, they had accidentally gotten some of the nylon webbing in the coke fitting oh a buckle. So when I didn't come up and I didn't come up, a diver came down. And he yanking and pulling and yanking and pulling and yanking. And he ran out of air and went up. 
And then another diver comes down, and he's yanking and pulling and yanking and pulling. And I'm thinking, I did not get through all this acad academics and get my head shaved to die upside down in the water. <laughs> and uh, he runs out of air, too. And I'm thinking, why don't they just pull me up? But I went ahead, and adrenaline is God's drug. And I tore it out and got out. And when I got up, it was to no applause whatsoever. I, I got up, and I, my whole class is yelling at the guy who is operating this Dilbert Dunker, bring her up, bring her up. And I thought, well, that's encouraging that they noticed that I wasn't <laughs> up yet. And so they pull it up, and there's no one in there. <laughs> and they, it, finally, they noticed that I was hacking and coughing uh, at the side of the pool. And I had to do it again because they said, I, we didn't witness you coming out. Oh, wow. Wow. But it, I got to clip myself yet. in that time. <laughs> wow. Okay, so you finish that stage, then you go on to Navy flight training. This time, there aren't three women. There's one woman, you, in right. the squadron, the, the only one. Pretty lonely experience. Yes. And uh, with a bunch of dudes. And, but your mom gave you some sage advice about how to make friends. Yes. Uh, I would notice that there would be kind of this buzz of just pilots talking pilot stuff in the, uh, in the ready room, which is where you hang out before you brief and after. And when I would step into that ready room, it would just go silent. And then when I left, I could kind of hear it bubbling up again to conversation. And it, I told my mom, man, I, I love the flying. Yeah. I had a great instructor, but I am... I am in no man's land. I mean, I am by myself. And she said, well, if you want a friend, be a friend. Uh, Invite somebody to dinner. And I said, Mom, these guys, it was mostly Marines. And I said, they're in warrior mode. I mean, they just finished the basic school. They don't want to go have dinner with somebody they don't even want to talk to at the squadron. And I thought, it's really sweet of her to, to try, but that's not going to work here. And just a couple of days later, I walk in. And the biggest, loudest Marine, Nelson Alberts, is uh, talking about it's his birthday soon. And his mom and dad sent him a big package. He had it. And everybody else fell silent because they saw me come in. But Nelson keeps yapping about it. And then he realizes something's behind him. And he turns around. And I said, well, happy birthday. I'd be glad to make you a birthday dinner and birthday cake if you want to invite four of your friends over. Nobody <laughs> said anything. I turned Quiet. around and left and just thought, my mom took over my body. <laughs> I, could, I didn't think that kind of thing could happen. But the next day he showed up, uh, handed me a, a scrap of paper with four names of his friends on it and said, Here, where do you live? Here's my invite list. Yeah. And we, he came over. We, um, we laughed, had such a great time. And some of us studied for the next two years together, and Nelson and I still keep in touch. <laughs> so <laughs> wow, wow. It was wow. good advice. Good old mom. She knows what she's <laughs> talking about. So one of, one of your, your most interesting stories in the book at this point is I love you describing what it's like to take off and land on a ship, a uh, moving, bobbing ship in the middle right. of the ocean. Just describe that for us because most of us are never, never going to have that experience. Well, and the carrier is probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest ships in our Navy. Uh, and at port, it's enormous. And we call it a ship. But once it leaves, it's a boat <laughs> because it is it's a speck. tiny <laughs> yeah. when you're looking at it from a cockpit. And one of the things now, in the Navy, we knew if we went jets, we would be carrier calling in two different aircraft before we even get our wings. But what they didn't tell us was the very first time you go out there, you're solo. Oh. So that was interesting. Well. But, and the joke is there's not enough money to pay anybody to be in your back seat the first time you come <laughs> aboard. Really? The truth is they want your own attention to detail yes. to be your safety net. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first time you put your hook down, uh, and coming in, you're in a group of four, uh, and uh, you do a break overhead, pull, you know, about five Gs as you come, 180 degrees around and go from, I don't know, 300-something knots to 150 in that turn and throw down your gear flaps. And as you roll in, you call your call sign, um, your fuel weight, 6.2, whatever, Buckeye ball. 
Buckeye was the first aircraft, okay. uh, the T2. Okay. And then the next time I went, it was Skyhawk Ball. Yeah. And, um, and you're just, you're doing um, meatball lineup angle of attack. Because the, the carrier, as it, as it moves in, creating wind over the deck for you to fly into, you launch straight ahead, but you land at an angle. So you, as you come in, you're, you're constantly correcting to keep lined up. Wow. Wow. And um, you've practiced hundreds of yes. these before you go yeah. on the ground, but not, not with your tail hooked down. And it's 600 feet per minute, rate of descent, controlled crash. And once you, once you touch down, you go to full power. It's, it's wait, it's called a controlled crash. Well, the Navy people call it that. <laughs> that's that, that's uh, encouraging. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if you if you happen to be on an airliner and you feel like it was a little bit firm, it wow. may be a Navy pilot still trying to get that flare. We'll we'll remember that as we fly commercially. <laughs> Navy pilot landing. Huh? Right. So, and what happens if your hook doesn't catch? If your hook doesn't catch, usually it's hook skip and it's called a bolter, which yes. means you've gone you've hit yeah. and you've gone full power. So you go right back Take up. Take off and, okay. Yeah, you, you go right back up 600 feet over the wow. water, come back around and do it again. Okay, so, you know, there are some airports in the country that I get nervous when, when we're landing. Mm -hmm. Logan in Boston, I used to live in Boston, and, you know, you're coming over the bay to land. On, <laughs> and I've always, always wondered, you know, do they ever, does someone ever not make it? Do they ever dump it? And I remember thinking, no, that never happens. And then you'd hear an occasional story about someone right. not quite making the, the runway. Does anybody ever miss the boat? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> in my personal experience, and I wasn't on the boat very often, uh, but I instructed carrier landings for a little while. And so I was there and getting a few uh, ec extra traps and cat shots myself and I was on the cat shot they'd already put tension on my jet and then we hear you know the announcement that the the boss who's watching all of it says we've got you do not eject and I'm thinking <laughs> he's not talking to me I'm fine I look around and there's this t2 that is hooked he he caught a wire but he wasn't lined up and so he'd gone over the edge, and he was hanging, hanging there. Oh, my goodness. Just the tail hook <laughs> holding on to Do it. not eject <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. so wow. it happens. Wow. So it, it's in the Navy that you experienced some of your first uh, discrimination. And uh, tell us about Ops O. You, you very creatively give these guys names so as not to totally out them in your book. Yes, only good guys get names. Yeah, yeah. So Ops O, what did he, you know, yeah. what did he do to you? Well, he, he kind of came on the scene uh, in a bad way earlier. And then in the Navy, whenever you finish primary training, depending on your grades and the needs of the Navy, um, helicopters, airplanes, propellers, or jets. And I had gotten jets, which was hard to get. And I'm in my advanced jet training now. And a couple of days before ta uh, he came into the ready room, I have to say the pair riggers who take care of our gear um, had come up to me and said, hey, if you need a new torso harness, China Lake is where you go to get one made. Okay. And I'm thinking, my torso harness is fine. I don't know why. Yeah. And then he whispers, he goes, the guys that need one go there. It's not a big deal. Just you can go to China Lake, get one made in a day. So why am I getting And then this he leaves. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. that was just bizarre. I don't even yeah. know the guy's name. I wonder why. And then two days later, the OPSO steps in. And he had been a dark shadow in my life anyway. And he said, Bonnell, my maiden name, your torso harness doesn't fit right. You're going to have to go to props. You need to start. So he demoted out. you from jets to props. Well, he just, tried. Just like that. He tried really hard. And everybody in the ready room just was kind of feeling like, man, bless her heart, she's gone. And just in front silent. of everybody, this happened. Yeah. Yeah, all the students, instructors. Wow. But I remembered that pair rigger uh, telling me, and I said, yeah. oh, sir, I'll just go out to China Lake and get one made, like the guys that need one. And he just took the wind out of his sails. It yeah. did. And he laughed, and I stayed in jets. Wow. Wow. In your book, you say, you know, this was one of those instances where your journaling pops up and you're <laughs> processing this. So, you know, help us out. 
How do you process something like, what do you say to God in your journal about this guy who's right. being a jerk? Well, first of all, I tattled on him completely. There wasn't anything that he, <laughs> he had offended me with that God didn't get firsthand from me, although he already knew. And again, my mom's um, guidance, just from junior high problems, you know, where people offend you, it's not fair, things happen, and she would say, tattle on them, tell God absolutely anything yeah. and everything. Tattle to the right person, God. Right. Yeah. And she pointed to how the Psalms so often do that, and then by the end of the chapter, they're praising the Lord. And she said, but remember, before you get up off your knees, pray for them. Wow. So that you take the bitterness out of your heart. Yes. And let, leave it at the Lord's feet. Yes. And so um, I, I would say that was a big part of it. And, and in journaling, I remember just talking to the Lord and asking James 1.5, yes. you know, for that wisdom, Lord, when do I dig a hole and, and lay low in my foxhole and let it uh, the storm pass, and when do I build a fort and fight? Wow. And the wisdom to win. And God will give you the wisdom happens. to know which, which approach to take. Right. You, you say in your book that uh, you got to avoid victimhood. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I think it's really easy when we only look at our own situation yeah. to see that's not fair. Yeah. That was wrong. That was, and, but you know, having a younger sister with cerebral palsy, I, I could always have a really easy uh, check on that and felt like I could never in my entire life pull out my victimhood card because I didn't have the right to that. Um, and God gives us such a great out yeah. from victimhood. Um, in First Timothy, excuse me, Second Timothy 1.7, that scripture where he says, I did not give you a spirit of fear or timidity but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And I always wondered power. I always thought he would have started with love, yes. you know. But as I took that, that scripture to heart and yes. over and over often, I realized I see his wisdom in the words that he chooses there because fear and power are like darkness and light. They can't cohabitate. So if we have the spirit of power... Fear is not a yes. part of yes. our personality. And then love and self-control, I think, is where he points us to Galatians 5.22. You know, those bookends of the fruit of the Spirit. Not the gifts, the fruit. We have it all when we give our lives to Christ. And the list there is very nice. Yes, yeah. yeah this is... This is, friends, this is part of the beauty of being a follower of Jesus. You're following a leader who's been there, who's been through the most difficult circumstances imaginable, who's been betrayed, who's been insulted, who's been abused. So he knows what those situations are like. And I'll tell you, yeah. that what one of the, the key takeaways I got from your book, Tammy Jo, was uh, how to face adversity that comes from, you know, from unfairness. Yeah. So I, I, I was thinking to myself, I know people I want to pass this book on to who they're either undergoing gender discrimination or racial discrimination or, or they just got a boss who's a jerk and making their life <laughs> difficult, you know, or a, an extended family member who's, who's making things difficult. I, you give us some, some great insight about how to address that. So I, I want to go now from military to Southwest, because you eventually get out of the military, uh, you pick up a husband along the way who's also a jet, a, a jet pilot, which is a, an amusing part of the story I'll let people <laughs> read for themselves. Um, you, you spent a year or so uh, fighting, uh, fighting fires from an airplane, okay, joining a company, but then yeah. you got word about some openings at, at Southwest. How did you get the job with Southwest Airlines? Well, uh, Dean and I had prayed about which way to go, and at that time, it, 19, excuse me, yeah, 1992, 93, uh, the airline industry was really uh, flat. There wasn't a lot of uh, companies hiring. And speaking at a ladies' luncheon, I met a mom whose son was in Southwest, and so it was kind of that tendril of knowledge that I got an introduction to Southwest, and so 
it was the personality of the company. Um, they're a solid financial company. You know, it was just such a fit. Yeah. Now, now I read that, that you know, in, in one day or one week, uh, there were like 5,000 applicants, though, for a job. Is that true? There were you know, I can't remember exactly the time frame, but I know that they, they quit accepting applications, yes. I think, at 5,000. Wow. And it was... If you didn't have your application in by July 1st, I think it was, it didn't even matter. Yes. Yeah. And so it was such a timing thing. And um, yeah, it was. Another one of those God things that he Very he much. Out. Okay. Yeah. okay. So Southwest, any of us who have flown on Southwest, we see it as the, the laid back, fun loving airlines and whatever. But you experienced some nastiness. Uh, <laughs> Give us just one example of that, okay? There was a Captain Henry and a Captain Janice. And again, I don't even know if those were the, you know, real names or fake names. But, you know, give, give us a story that will help us uh, gain a sense of what it right. felt like. This, again, discrimination that you're facing. Yeah, I had left the Navy. Uh, there was a lot going on in the Navy with... Uh, women pilots. Uh, they would lifted the combat exclusion policy, so women were now able to fly in combat squadrons. My year group was a cutoff, so I, I could not. But um, So there was a lot of pushback, because now women would not only be able to fly in combat squadrons, but they were uh, a bit able to promote to any seat of, uh, you know, any promotion there. So there's a lot of competition now there. And there were some other things that had happened that had stirred it up. So I thought, oh, it's just going to be so nice to kind of leave all that battling behind <laughs> and move on to commercial airlines. But in commercial world, there was some other battles that were going on. And, um, and there still weren't that many female pilots out there yeah. yet. So Unbeknownst to me, there was a, a bit of venom running through some of the, some people's cockpits. And when you get there, it's just you and your captain, the door shut, and you have three days of sitting a foot and a, par, foot and a half apart. Yeah. And so I would fly with these guys. They were not, it's definitely not behavior that was supported by the company. Yes. But, uh, and we've all been there, you know, where you know that they wouldn't act like that in front of other people. Yes. But uh, one captain, when we got to 10,000 feet, which is aviation, uh, you're, it's a sterile cockpit below 10,000 feet. You talk about airplane things only. You talk about your flight and the weather and ra stuff like that. But at 10,000 feet, you have the relaxation of you can speak about other things yeah. now. And when we got to 10,000 feet, he, uh, and we have a call, you know, 10,000 feet, and he'd turn, turn off a light or whatever, and, and he turns to me and he goes, I hate you. And I thought at first, he'd been so, kind of nice up to that point, and I kind of waited thinking he's got a punchline. Yeah. yeah, I waited, and it <laughs> didn't come. In fact, more venom came out, and then whenever we were at the gate, and I would go back and help pick up trash because at Southwest everybody kind of pitches in it was a good chance to stretch my legs and mix with the flight attendants who were not so um, determined in their attitudes and I would come back and he would have thrown my hat down and stomped on it and your, it your broke flight it hat, your, yeah, my, your pilot my hat. first officer hat <laughs> he they're 60 bucks <laughs> and so uh, so you know it was it looked pretty sad so I didn't wear it so he reported me for not wearing my hat I bought another one he did the same thing the next week. I, my mom and dad both said, you're kind of a slow learner, Tammy. Don't put that hat over there. Get it, hide it, you know. So I did, and I, I didn't have to buy but three that month. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, it was just, it was ugly. You would just not expect that kind of juvenile behavior out of a professional. No. Yeah, 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 no. yeah. Wow, wow. So, okay, I want to take us to April 17th, 2018. Sure. Uh, set the stage for us. Tell us what happened. I'll just turn it over to you. Turn the controls over to you. Okay. All right. I've got the aircraft. Um, it, it was a, a day that Darren and I had flown one day, so I just met him the day before. And that morning, I met the flight attendants for the first time. And then we, we took off from Nashville, LaGuardia, and got ready, filled the airplane, every seat full, heavy with fuel and headed to Dallas, Texas from LaGuardia. 
Passing 32,600 feet, we heard an explosion and then felt like we got hit by a Mack truck on the captain's side and just the aircraft just skidded sideways, pitched over in a dive and did a snap roll to the left. And looking at the NTSB, the black box, so to speak, of what happened to the aircraft, that was all in a moment, not a second, a moment. Wow. And Darren and I grabbed the controls and leveled the wings, and we could see the engine instruments rolling back and flashing, so we knew we'd lost number one engine. And later, Darren and I had compared notes, and both of us thought we'd been struck by another aircraft. Uh, the jolt was just so sudden and so violent. But as we leveled the wings, suddenly we couldn't see anything. There was uh, smoke filled the cockpit, and uh, there was such a shuddering that we couldn't focus our eyes on our instruments or on the checklists. And then a roar that we, it just smothered every sound. Darren and I sit pretty close together and we couldn't even hear our own voices, let alone each other's. So we used hand signals initially. And then we both had a stabbing Wait, pain. You know, hands, do they teach you this? Oh in, no, in that's, that's just... Okay. Cuban nature. Okay, I didn't you know, know like if there was some kind of When I slap you, language. I want your attention. You okay. know, when I All point right. to something, yes. look at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we, that's how we did it for a while. And, and then uh, we realized we had these ice pick pains in our ears and we weren't being able to breathe either. So that's kind of an isolating moment uh, in time. And I think everybody had an adrenaline rush, you know, Yes. when all of that came to bear. And I remember taking life down to the bare bones of good news, bad news, and I always take bad news first. So the bad news is I don't know that we're going to keep everything on, the big pieces anyway, until we get to a runway. And This could I, be it. This could be it. And I just mentally ran to those cliffs of what if, and then I realized this could be the day I meet my maker and I won't meet a stranger. And I stepped back from that precipice, turned around with a calm that was not of myself. I know I used years, 30 plus years of, of habits and uh, training and experience, but the calm I would have to give credit to the Lord for. Yeah, and they, don't, they don't train this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah and just looked at the, at the good news now, and that was we're still flying. I'm not sure everybody feels the same yeah. that I do in this airplane, so we'll just keep <laughs> flying. So we don't anymore. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So this is all going. On. As I understand it, Darren was flying the. Your co-pilot was was starting to fly the plane. Right. But when something like this happens, the rules are the captain takes over. So right. you're you're now flying the plane. Right. And yes. and did you know what was going on in the cabin that there was this lady who had been half sucked no. out the window and. Uh, no. Okay. Not at all. So until you didn't later. know that till you landed. Oh, we knew that because we had to slow down. Uh, okay. They called us and said, you're going to have to slow down so we can get her back in. Okay. And um, so we knew it, but we didn't know it until like 8,000 feet. Okay. Um, so so. They, they redirected you to Philadelphia, was it? Well, we asked for Philadelphia. We, we just told them we're headed to Philadelphia. When you're in an emergency okay. situation, you can kind of tell them what you're going to do. And um, they were great about clearing things out ahead of us. And... Uh, it was, you know, it was really an unscripted combination of emergencies going down. And we only knew basically what I told you. Later, we would find out that our engine had exploded. And the big pieces, ATC said that they've, they've tracked those big pieces down to the ground with radar and found oh them there goodness. in Pennsylvania. But the little pieces did the damage. So that's uh, what th that's what pierced the uh, the window. The window it tore chunks out of the okay. leading edge of our wing, the uh, fuselage, the tail, and it also peeled back the engine cowling, which is a smooth covering over the engine, and it was peeled back kind of like a banana peeling, remaining attached and flailing in 500 mile an hour wind. Wow! And and the roar was from the window open and the. Uh, rapid depressurization or explosive depressurization, which is like a balloon popping. That's yes. a rapid depressurization. Yeah. Yeah. And we were at 7,000 feet pressurized inside, 32,000 feet outside, and that is a huge differential. So oh, it was an explosive. 
So um, you, the good news is you land the plane and you're, you're here today. When, when you right. listened to your flight recorder afterwards, right. wh what, what did you hear yourself saying? You know, I, I had no idea that it was out loud. Uh, as we got closer to Philadelphia and we were having to fly right over the heart of the city, they asked us to level off at 4,000. I agreed to it. And then we realized we can't. When we tried to level off, we started losing control of the aircraft because you need quite a bit of uh, air over the rudder oh, to give okay. it authority okay. to keep your nose straight. Because with that damage over here, it was just dragging the nose to the left. And as we tried to add power, it pushed the nose to the left and airplanes don't fly well sideways. So we had to pull the power back. I left on a little bit, but we just told them we're taking it in from here. We can't fly an approach. We can't level off. And we rethought our, our approach and just did more of a glider approach into Philadelphia. Now, we were still 90 degrees off from the runway. And I had a little power in, which was the first time, because I'd come down at, uh, at idle to get down. And air traffic control very calmly tells me, OK, the runway is at 4 o'clock, which clock code wise, if this is 12, that means it's behind me. Yeah. You know, that was their hint of, you're passing it up. There's silence then on ATC. There's silence in the cockpit. Yeah. And then there's just two words from me out loud in the form of a question. And it's, Heavenly Father? <laughs> and, and I had no idea. I thought it was a private conversation. Darren, when we listened to this, he goes, I knew you were praying. <laughs> I said, yeah, all the way down. Yeah. But it was just, uh, I couldn't turn the aircraft. Yeah. Uh, we had never had a little power even in before and done any turns to the right. And I couldn't pull the nose around to the right. And we were 90 degrees off, headed out to water. And um, I, I just asked the Lord, you know, Heavenly Father, the yeah. finish of that sentence is, what am I missing? Yeah. And just like prayer always takes that metal cage off your mind so that you get out of that hamster wheel and you, God gives us some room to be inspired. And I remembered a true story about Captain Al Haynes who turned his airliner around with asymmetrical thrust. And asymmetrical thrust was really my problem. So at first I thought that's not gonna work. And then I realized, no, no, it's the problem, but it's also the solution. So I pulled that power off got turned around, we were below glide slope, we landed slower than we anticipated, you know, it was a loss of, of the energy that we planned on, but uh, we made the runway. Wow, wow. Tammy Jo, I wanna wrap things up by just making reference to uh, your closing chapter in your book. Mm -hmm. You talk about habits and hope. Right. Uh, the sort of habits that need to be in place so when life throws you something like this, you, you know, th this isn't the time to be inventive in terms of uh, trying something, uh, something new that you've never done before. This is when the habit of prayer kicks in and you pray the Heavenly Father. Y you know, this is when the scriptures that you have read and you've memorized, they come to mind. Right. This is when you're thankful that you've been part of a church of brothers and sisters that you know are praying for you and, and, right. and whatnot. So, so that's the habits side of things. You know, just a, a really good life lesson for us that we need to develop really good habits that will stand us well in difficult times. But hope, just, you know, in, in conclusion, where does your hope come from? You talk about habits and hope, okay? Where does hope come from in, in the midst of life's difficult circumstances? Right. And I'll use, I'll use my flight as a small example to set the stage for the really big hope. And when, when we got our oxygen masks on and I realized how startling it was for us, it had to be mind-numbing for the people in the back. So I told them. I made a PA and said, we're not going down. We're going into Philly. And got back to flying. The flight attendants who were buckled up, unbuckled, got on their feet, started down this really rough aisle to help people get their oxygen mask on and yell over 500 mile an hour wind, we're not going down, we're going into Philly. And, and passengers unbuckled to come help a stranger in a very dangerous area. And hope just really changed us. It didn't change our circumstances. Yeah. And so that, I looked at that at the end of the day and realized you know, when we have a destination, 
we have a hope. And eternally, wow. I mean, wow. hope. Yeah. When we have that destination, yes. which Christ has promised, I've gone before you to prepare a place for you. Yeah. So when you have a place, when you have a destination for Darren and I, we started problem solving from there back yeah. to where we were. We're going to Philly. Let's get there. And now yes. eternally you look at, yes. I have a hope in Christ. Yeah. And you work backwards from there and it per puts things in perspective. Yeah. Well, it, as, we, as we conclude this interview, uh, I want to offer you the hope that Tammy jo has been, been talking about. Okay, how do you get this kind of hope? So that no matter what happens, when life hits the fan, uh, you have this equanimity, you have this sense of peace, you have the sense that God is in control. Uh, you know, it, tr it traces back to that decision she made just prior to high school to surrender her life to Christ. Uh, you know, so Christ became the leader of her life. He became the king, the savior, the friend. How do you get that? Uh, around Christ Community Church, we say, well, it begins with a surrender prayer. It begins the moment you decide to surrender your life to Christ. So, uh, when we do these Inspiring Stories weekends, we invite a guest who's got a faith story to tell that points to, here's how to begin a relationship with Jesus by surrendering to Christ. And so we always conclude by giving people an opportunity to do that. So that's what I want you to do right now. If you're watching at one of our, our five campuses or you're watching this online, uh, would you just take a moment, bow your head with me. I'm going to lead you in a surrender prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer. Uh, there, there's nothing magical about the, the, the language of the prayer. The sincerity of your heart is what really matters right now. And we like to say around Christ Community Church that the surrender prayer includes three very prominent words. The first word is sorry. See, you, you don't surrender to Christ unless you realize that you've been going your way instead of God's way. And you know, that's the root cause behind everything wrong we do. Every sin, whether it's pride or anger or lust or greed, materialism, disregard for the poor, whatever's going on in our lives that's out of sorts is because we're trying to run things. And so the surrender prayer begins by saying, God, I'm sorry. I've been trying to be the king, the queen of my own life, sitting on my throne, running things instead of turning the controls over to you. So let me give you a moment right now as you're bowed before Almighty God. You know, even if you're surrounded by your family right now in a, in a family room watching this, in the quietness of your heart, would you just say, sorry, God. I am sorry for trying to run things on my own. Sorry for going my way instead of your way. You know, if you want to personalize it, there may be some, some manifestation of this, uh, you know, I'm in control problem. Maybe, maybe it is your materialism. Maybe it's conflict in relationships. You know, what is it that kind of tips you off that you've been doing it your way? Just tell God you're sorry for that. The second key word in a surrender prayer is the word thanks. Okay, here's the problem, friend. When we go our way instead of God's way, we disconnect from the one who is the giver of life. It, it's like uh, pulling the plug of a lamp out of the wall socket. When you pull it out, the lamp goes dead. Okay, when you disconnect from the giver of life because you've gone your way instead of his way, the result is death. The wages of sin is death. So says the Bible in Romans 6, verse 23. So God, in his mercy and his grace, sent his son to earth. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus come to earth. But he grew up to give his life on a cross, to die, to take the death we deserve to die, to pay the penalty for our sin. The penalty is death. Have you ever realized that Jesus did this not just for the world? He did it for you. Have you ever told him, thank you? Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for giving your life to be my savior. I'm going to give you a moment right now. You've got to personalize this. It's got to come from your heart. Would you tell God thanks for sending Jesus? Tell Jesus thanks for giving your life for me.
So you've prayed sorry and you've prayed thanks. And the third word is please. This is where you entreat Jesus to come into your life. He sends his Holy Spirit to come live on the inside and make you a brand new person from the inside out. He becomes the leader of your life. Okay, this isn't just like a a free pass to get into heaven. This is a new life that begins now. Under the lordship, under the leadership of Jesus, you say, please come in. Please help me to, to begin to understand the Bible, your word. Please help me to find a group of people like those at Christ Community Church who are following following you because I need the camaraderie of others to lead me in the right direction. Please, 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 Jesus, make me into a new person. You put it in your words. I'll give you just a moment to do that. God, you say in your word that nobody nobody comes to you unless you're drawing them. Our, Our bent, our natural bent is to move away from you. So if there are people praying this prayer right now, this surrender prayer, it could only be because you are drawing, you're tugging their heart in your direction. So please help them not to resist, but to surrender. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.